Hey there and welcome to this video. In this video I want to show you how it is possible to train a text to image model that can create these kind of images with a fraction of the compute used to train Stable Diffusion 1.4, while these images are even higher resolution. This work is called Würstchen and is another collaboration with my friend Pablo. I'm again really excited to show you how it works and will give my very best to explain it in the easiest possible way. Last time I already showed you our previous project, Paella. So don't be confused by the names, we just find it funny naming our models after food that we like. So what is Würstchen? Würstchen is a text-to-image diffusion model that works in an extremely compressed space. You may be wondering why this is important. You can remember the following. The smaller the size of your data you're training on, the cheaper the costs for the training. Training a model that can generate 32 by 32 pixel images is much cheaper than training the same model at 1024 by 1024 pixels. At this point it would be really beneficial to understand how neural compressions like VQGANs work. If you already know that, perfect, otherwise you can check out my video about VQGANs here. But to summarize, basically a VQGAN leverages the fact that the pixel space is very sparse and compresses images into a smaller latent space while retaining rich semantics of the images. Usually this compression is relatively small though. Stable Diffusion uses a factor 8 spatial compression. That means a 512 by 512 image gets compressed into 64 by 64. Paella uses an F4 compression, which means a 512 by 512 image gets compressed into 128 by 128. You may also be wondering why not use a much higher compression. The reason is that methods such as VQGANs, VAEs or regular autoencoders cannot faithfully reconstruct images when working on much higher compressions. Even a factor of 16 loses a lot of details in images. However, with Würstchen we went to extremes here and introduced a new way of compressing images. The big novelty is that we have a much much bigger compression than usual. Würstchen achieves a 40 times spatial compression encoding 512 by 512 images into 12 by 12. And as I told you before, this enables to train the text conditional model in the small latent space much much faster than other methods. This enables a way more sustainable way of doing research and testing out ideas really fast. And with Würstchen it becomes feasible to train a really good text to image model for much cheaper and way more affordable to more companies and hopefully at some point even to individuals. So let's jump into how Würstchen works and how this big compression can be achieved. Stable Diffusion uses a VAE to compress images. Paella uses a VQGAN to achieve that. The models themselves are slightly different, but the common denominator is that it is a single model that is being used to encode images into the small latent space. The novelty with Würstchen is that we make use of a second model that is responsible for compressing the image even further. And then we learn a model in the very small latent space for the text conditional part, same as Stable Diffusion and Paella. So the overall approach in all methods is, first try to compress images to a small resolution in a latent space, where you then learn a conditional model to reduce the computation needed. In Würstchen we refer to the compression models as stage A and stage B, and the text conditional model as stage C. Let's look at all the stages separately and understand how they work. Stage A will be the easiest if you know how a VQGAN works, because it's literally a VQGAN. We take an image and encode it to a quantized latent space. The VQGAN has an F4 compression. It actually is the same as the one we used in Paella. So we encode 512 by 512 images to 128 by 128 latents. Super easy so far, right? Now stage B is the new interesting part. Stage B is responsible for learning the even higher compression because the VQGAN hits its limits very soon and can only enable a small compression given the requirement that the reconstructions should be almost perfect. What we do is the following. The image by now is already encoded with the VQGAN encoder, so we have 128 by 128 latents. Stage B is a diffusion model that learns to remove noise from noised VQGAN latents. This sounds very similar to regular text-to-image diffusion models like Stable Diffusion, right? Regular text-to-image models noise images and try to denoise them given a text conditioning, right? Instead of giving the model a text conditioning, we condition the model on the image itself, but not in its plain form. We provide the model with a representation of the image after encoding it with a different encoder model. 
You might be confused now and wondering why do we do that? Isn't that like cheating by just giving the model the image that it needs to denoise just in a different form? Shouldn't it be super easy for the model to learn? The big catch in what enables the increased compression is that the image encoder encodes the image into a very small latent space. Stage B needs to reconstruct the noised image latents from an encoding of the image that is very small. This works much better than text conditioning for example, because denoising an image given the caption a red apple gives infinite possibilities, but with a good image embedding this task is much easier as the possibilities shrink. Although we as humans can probably not easily understand this image encoding, a good comparison is to just imagine the model receives a downscaled version of the image. Compare this to just giving you the text a red apple. The former will be much easier for you to denoise. So that is basically the big idea. We frame it as a denoising diffusion model because it's much easier to reconstruct the image if the model has multiple inferences, instead of just trying to predict it with a model in a single step. So during training we take the images, encode them with the VQ GAN, noise the latents with different amounts of noise, encode the images with the encoder as well and provide this as a conditioning to the model, which then tries to denoise the VQ GAN image latents. After this is trained we can take any image, encode it and decode it. Take any image, encode it with this encoder and then do a normal diffusion sampling by iteratively denoising and noising. Then after a couple of steps you have the final VQGAN latents and you can then take the VQGAN decoder to bring the images into pixel space. And this works quite well and achieves very big compressions. Let's look at some results. Here you can see the original images and on the other side the reconstructions. On a high level you can barely notice the difference with most things, which is really cool. But if you come closer and look at the details of faraway objects like humans, you will see artifacts coming up. And that is probably Verstein's biggest drawback at the moment, making up fine details. However, we think there is still a lot of room for improvement and are sure we can improve this in the future. I quickly also want to talk a bit about the specific details of this approach. The model that encodes the images into the very tiny space is an efficient net. This is a small 20 million parameter model that for example encodes 512 by 512 images into 12 by 12. This is a spatial compression of 42. Stable diffusion only has a spatial compression of 8, which encodes 512 by 512 images to 64 by 64. Here you can see the comparison between Versian's reconstructions and that from the VAE used by stable diffusion. In many things you can barely notice the difference. For the sake of demonstration, we also trained a VQGAN that has a spatial compression of 32, just to show how big the difference is and how it is really not possible to achieve high compressions with the standard autoencoder approach. And note that this is only a spatial compression of 32. Stage B is doing a spatial compression of 42 here. The diffusion model of stage B, so the decoder, is 600 million parameters. Next to the diffusion model decoder, we also trained the efficient net during the stage B training. The reason is that the efficient net was trained on image net data, so the features it has learned may not be as representative for general images from the web. That's why we fine tune it to our data. And the reason why we chose to use it was because it is very small and easy to train instead of using some huge model with like 1 billion parameters. It is literally very efficient. Ok, that is the entire stage B. After training it, we are able to encode and decode images into a very small latent space. Now we can take care of learning the text conditional model in the small latent space. That is what stage C is responsible for. It is a diffusion model as also used in stable diffusion, but still with significant differences in the architecture and training. First of all we need a huge dataset with image and text pairs. Then we encode images with the aforementioned efficient net. We take the latents and noise them with the standard diffusion training procedure. The noise latents together with the caption and the time step are fed to the model, which is tasked to predict the noise in the image. The prediction is compared to the actual noise using the mean squared error. We start by training on 512 by 512 images, which results in a latent size of 12 by 12. And the big benefit is obvious. 
Training the text conditional diffusion model at a 12x12 latent space is much cheaper than training at 64x64 like Paella or Stable Diffusion. By how much? I don't have exact measurements, but Stable Diffusion 1.4 took 150,000 GPU hours, whereas our first version used only 9,000 GPU hours to achieve very similar results. This is not where we stop though. After the model has learned a lot already, we move to 1024 by 1024 images, which gives a latent size of 24 by 24. This results in much better reconstructions by stage B and much more room for stage C to learn details, etc. And that's basically already all there is. I'll go a bit more into the details in a second, but these are some results of our latest model that we trained. Some of these images that you see are even 1024 by 2048. This usually doesn't work because models are usually exclusively trained on square images. However, after the model was fully trained, we showed images that were vertical and horizontal as well, trying to teach the model how different aspect ratios look like. It worked surprisingly well after already 4000 steps and you can see the results on the screen here. It's very interesting how fast models can adapt to new things. And all these generations are from what we call version v2, the successor of a first version model. It was training longer and at a higher resolution than v1 and trained for about 24,000 GPU hours. That is still 6 times less than Stable Diffusion 1.4 while having its base resolution at 1024. The architecture of the Stage C model is extremely simple. Since our latent size is already very small, we do not use a unit. Units are usually required to reduce the spatial sizes of inputs because otherwise it would be too computationally expensive having all layers at the input resolution. At 12x12 there's no need for that. We therefore just do a bunch of residual and attention blocks and voila, that's it. We inject the text information via cross-attention. If you're not familiar with cross-attention, you can check out my video. We also inject the time step into the model in order to easily tell it how much noise is present in the image. Very simple, right? I also did a video about diffusion models in case you want to refresh in your knowledge on how they work. And something that we put a lot of value to is that all of our work is open source. You can find a link to the GitHub with all the code for training and inference and model weights in the description and also use the model in the well-known Python library Diffusers. To use it with Diffusers, you can just go to the Hugging Face page and look at the examples. If you want to dive a bit deeper into the model and how the sampling works, you can take a look at the notebook on GitHub. It'll take a bit more time to get the gist, but essentially it should be very easy as well. I will also put a link to the paper in the description and further resources if you're interested. For now, that's everything and I hope you liked the video. This video is shorter than usual and doesn't go into much detail. Let me know what you think of this style and if you prefer longer videos that go into the real details of a method. But for now I really hope you enjoyed the video. And with that being said, I wish you a nice day.